So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Moffitt and I have the pleasure of working with Drew Ops here at Drew Ops. Uh, this is the sixth year that I've been here, so I'm probably, unless you're a sixth year senior, I'm uh, probably not here already. Are you six years here? No, no, no. <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight because I know there are a lot of other places that you can be. Uh, you can be studying, you can be watching TV, you can be doing whatever it is you guys do these days. Uh, but you chose to be here, so I'm really glad that you made that choice because I think uh, there's going to be something uh, that God has for you. I mean, Savannah's already done a great job of explaining humility and the cross, and so we just want to continue to dig a little deeper into that. And so I think this, rooms like this are really important to me because it's you guys who are going to reach the Greek system. We're never going to have 5,500 people come to a Dulos meeting. So Dulos doesn't just happen here in this room. Dulos happens when you go to chapter, and when you go to dinner, and when you talk to a new brother or a new sister. Dulos happens within the confines of your house or at your apartment with people that you live with. That's what Dulos is about. This is kind of just the tip of the iceberg, and we want to utilize this to kind of propel you guys to go and do what Dulos is all about. Loving God, sharing Christ, making disciples. So I'm really glad that you've chosen to be here tonight. And, and we hope that you will leave a changed person to be able to walk after God more fervently and to proclaim his gospel more accurately and more effectively. So uh, let me pray to that end so that what it comes out of my mouth is from God and not just from me. God, thank you for uh, these students that are here. And God, we do thank you for blessing them in the University of Florida. And we do ask, God, that your spirit would descend upon us in a fresh new way, that we'd be able to taste and see that you're good, and that others would be able to taste and see that also. God, there are so many students on this campus who are yet to know you personally. And would you use us to be the mouthpiece for you to share Christ with them and disciple them towards maturity in Christ, so that they can leave this place with the gospel in their hand, wherever they are, wherever they go, they can impact people for Christ. Amen. So if, uh, is anybody here for the first time this semester? You, didn't, you missed last meeting. Okay, let me catch you guys up to speed real quick. We're in a series talking, um, did everyone get a little card here? We're in a series based on this verse, 2 Chronicles 7.14, and the idea behind this is personal revival. Personal revival that then leads to corporate or collective revival. And so revival starts in an individual's heart when they get a better picture of who God is and they're awed by it and they're humbled by it. And it changes the way they live their life. It changes their priorities. It changes sometimes their major, sometimes who they're dating. It changes a lot of things towards Christ. And so... Uh, last week, we, or two weeks ago, we talked about the first part of this, which says, if my people who are called by my name, and tonight we're just going to look at two words, humble themselves. So tonight, we're going to look at humbling ourselves, and that's not an easy thing to do. If we put together a list of the top 100 things that students at UF would say about Greek life, do you imagine that humility would even be on that list of 100 things? <laughs> There's no way. They would never say that. Uh, so it's, if, if there could be a difference that you can make in your chapter, it might be through something as crazy as humility because it would stand out in such contrast to Greek life. Not just Greek life in, in particular, but the whole University of Florida. I don't know if that would show up on that list of just describing the University of Florida. Uh, so, my hope tonight is that we'll walk away here seeing not just how to be more humble, but we'll, we'll see the motivation from God to be more humble. Because if we're not humble, we're going to miss God. And if we're not humble, others around us are going to miss God. Because humility always precedes a personal revival in our heart. And humility al always precedes 
uh, a person's initial conversion to Christ, their initial salvation. You can't come to Christ proud. You have to come to Him humbly. So those of you here tonight who already have a personal relationship with Christ, you know what that feels like to bow your knee to Christ and surrender to Him and ask Him into your life for forgiveness. And that's an act of humility. And then somewhere along the way, we kind of lose that and we try to do things in our own efforts. And so that's what I want us to hear tonight is that if you get nothing else tonight, get this, that God fights the proud, but he gives favor to the humble. That's actually on your sheet. We'll get to that in a second. But that's kind of the big picture of where, what I want you to leave if you, if you leave with nothing else, remember that God fights against those that are proud, but he favors or gives grace to the humble. So here's the passage. 2 Chronicles 7.14 If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. So the word revival is not even in that passage. I'm not even sure that's a, a word in the Bible. I think it's just a word the religions use to describe that a person or a group of people um, have an encounter with God that radically shifts their life. And that's what we talked about last time. Is we need a shift in the status quo of Christianity in Greek life. And a shift of Christianity's status quo at U.S. Because it doesn't look like it's supposed to look are the people that claim to be Christ's followers. So that's why I'm glad that you guys are here because the shift is going to start individually with us before it spills over into Greek life and before it spills over into UF as a whole. So, we'll humble themselves. And I think we get a different picture from the world of what humility is. For example, um, sometimes we think of humility as simply being embarrassed. And I remember one of my most embarrassing moments. Should I share this? Yes. Uh, it's probably not my most embarrassing because it happened way back when I was 14 years old. Uh, I was playing in a baseball tournament. This was the Pony League World Series. You probably heard of the Little League World Series and never the Pony League. But we went all the way from Chicago to Pennsylvania to play. We came third in the world, which was cool. But this one particular uh, game, I was on second base. Leading off, I'm noticing the pitcher's not really paying attention to me, so I take off and I steal third, standing up, didn't even need to slide, there was no throw, nothing. And so I'm looking at my third base coach, you know, with a smile on my face, and he is like, what are you doing? I'm like, coach, what, what? And there was my friend Pete Schulte standing right there, he was already on third base. And Pete's like, go back to second. So I run back to second, there's a throw, I'm safe, all that, you know. But my teammates are like, what in the world? You don't steal third when there's somebody already on third base. There's a reason there was no throw, and it was easy. And so in front of literally the most people I'd ever played in front of before at 14 years old, probably 10,000 people in the stands, I stole third base when third base was already occupied. <laughs> so sometimes people say that's what is humbling or that's what humility is, and simply being embarrassed. But I don't think that's what the word says. But that's what the world says. Um, it also sometimes is just simply people think it's being disappointed. So right after, uh, that was going into my freshman year, that was the summer before freshman year, so then I go to high school, I try out for the baseball team, I just come from the Pony League World Series where we took third in the world, and for some reason the coach cut me from the freshman baseball team. Not the varsity, not the junior varsity, <laughs> the freshman team. I didn't even make the freshman team. So my disappointment level was so great. That was probably the, the biggest devastating thing that happened to me in my short 14 years of life. The only solace that I took was Michael Jordan, who a few years earlier had been drafted by the Bulls, which was the team that I followed. He, I learned, had been cut from his freshman basketball team. So I figured, well, if Michael Jordan could kind of rise up, maybe I could rise up over two. That didn't happen quite as well, but uh, the point is that sometimes we get confused with what humility really is. Is it just being embarrassed, or is it just being disappointed? Sometimes that's how the world defines it. But Savannah's already told us what it really looks like. And I want to read some more of that passage that she read for you in Philippians 2, there on your page. 
It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest only, but also to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. That word in Greek is what? Doulos. There you go. Doulos. Being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. How? By becoming obedient. Obedient to what? Obedient to death. Even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So this is a great picture of humility. The, the most humbling thing that has ever been done, I think, is mentioned in this passage. There's a couple of them. One is Jesus comes from heaven, the glories of heaven, and he comes to sinful earth. There, there is no greater step of humility than coming from heaven to earth. But the uh, theologians call it the incarnation. When Jesus, who was spirit, took on a fleshly body and became a human like us. How amazing is that? The creator of the universe kind of compacted himself down into a human body and he looked like us. He was a person like us. And so not only was it this great transfer in terms of location, but can you imagine the sinless, holy, perfect God walking around earth with all of us? All of the mess and all of the sin and all of the brokenness. And here he is, the perfect holy one, walking around in our midst. The, the, the utter humility that it took to make that decision, to leave heaven and come to earth, I think is the most humiliating or humbling thing a person could ever do. And that's why it wasn't a person, it was God. The second thing you see in there is that he, um, he became obedient. Sometimes we don't think about humility and obedience as kind of the same thing, but it requires great humility to obey someone to submit to them or to surrender to them. In fact, um, in order to submit or to surrender to someone, you have to be doing something that you really don't want to do. Otherwise, you're just doing what you want to do. For example, I, have, I asked my son last night if he would babysit our younger girls, and he did not want to do it. But he did it because he submitted to me and like was obedient to what I asked. But if he wanted to, to, to babysit them, then it wouldn't have been a submission thing. It would have just been getting what you want. So intrinsic in, in obedience and intrinsic in surrender and submitting to someone is actually doing something that you didn't prefer to do in the first place. Does that make sense? So this is what Jesus did. He became obedient to death. You remember Jesus said, God, if it's your will, let this cup, the cup of um, the crucifixion, pass from me. But then he said, not my will, but your will be done. And so he submitted, obedient to death. And he sacrificed himself for us. So the why question, why should I humble myself? The answer is because if you want to fight against God, being proud, you will always lose. It is a losing battle to fight against God. God always fights or is opposed to the proud. But he favors and gives grace to the humble. Anyone who comes and bows their knee to him, he will receive. And so, in fact, there might be people here tonight who may have been around Christian stuff or around religious services, that, but you've never really bowed your knee to them. <coughs> tonight is a night you can do something like that. And you can enter into a personal relationship with God. But it always starts by humbling yourself before Him. So why should you do this? Because if you don't humble yourself, guess what? God will humble you. <coughs> And it isn't always easy, or it isn't always fun. It's always better to humble yourself before God, so He doesn't have to humble you. 
and you look around at people that seem to be just getting away with everything. You see these folks that are making millions and billions of dollars are apart from Christ. But their day will come. Just as this verse says, one day, every knee will bow. Literally or forcibly. And they will bow their knee to Christ and their tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so tonight, I want to ask you if you will simply bow your knee to Christ and let your tongue confess that He is Lord so He doesn't have to humble you. So that's what um, that's what these circles are here for. I'm going to try to draw a little bit. I'm not a great artist, but... <laughs> okay. So if you got a pen, go ahead and draw a little uh, a chair in each circle. It'll look like a, a lowercase h. It doesn't have to be great. If you're an artist, go ahead and make it really nice. Can you guys even see the one? Okay, so there are three kinds of people that live in the world according to the Bible. The first is... Put your name right there on the chair. You're in control. And Christ, draw a little cross out here. Christ is outside your life. Oh, there we go. Can y'all see that? So this is how we all start. We're born without Christ. We're born into sin. Uh, every one of us has rebelled and sinned against God in some way to separate ourselves against Christ. But the goal is to be Christ is on the throne and I am yielding to Christ. So draw Christ here on the throne and put your name kind of at the foot so you're submitting yourself to Christ. <laughs> So those who are Christians have made this move from here to here. And uh, the Bible says you do that by grace through faith. You can't earn getting to heaven. You can't earn God's love and favor. But you can receive it as a gift that He's offered to you. And so I know many of you in here tonight have already done that. You have made that shift from you're not on the throne, but God is coming into your life by grace through faith. By grace. So something else happens, though, during your Christian life, and that's represented in this circle. <laughs> well, Christ is still in your life, but He's now on the side of the throne, and you're calling the shots. So... If a person becomes a Christian by grace through faith, how would you imagine a Christian moves from this place where they are in control to back where Jesus is in control? There's four words. By grace through faith. The exact same way a person becomes a Christian is the way a person lives out the Christian life. And so it's almost like we're on a pendulum between, if you're a Christian, a pendulum between you being on the throne of your life and God being on the throne. So I hope that makes sense, because um, this is what, for me, radically transformed my Christian life when I was in college, was understanding that Christ was in my life, but how do I get out of this place where I'm always frustrated, I have this up and down spiritual experience, uh, I'm giving into sin all the time, I don't have any victory in my life, I'm certainly not having a good prayer time or studying the Word. Well, when, when I'm in control, it's all about the fleshly desires that I'm going after, and, and none of the fruit of the Spirit are there. And so when Jesus is on the throne of your life, and He's empowering you, and He's guiding you, and He's leading you, then that's when the fruit of the Spirit starts to happen. And you don't even have to try, because you don't try to produce fruit. Fruit just happens when the Spirit is leading your life. So before we get to the discussion questions, I wanted to... Um, give you a couple ideas for practically how does this 
uh, how can you begin to be humble and humble yourself before God so that God doesn't have to humble you in a harsh kind of uh, parent way? Like, you know, a parent spanks their child not because they hate them, but because they love them. Well, God will do the same thing. And I don't want you to get those words from God. I want you to bow your knee before so that you can enjoy Him as a father. Okay, so it's going to come right out of the passage from Philippians 2. The first one is, in order to humble yourself, be present with other people. Be present. So the, the thought is that Jesus came from heaven down to earth, and he was literally present with us. He could have sent messengers. He could have sent angels. He could have written it in the sky. Here's how you get to God. But instead, he chose to come down from heaven to earth, and he was present with us. And so one of the values we have in Dulos is that you have a, a be present, incarnational type of ministry in your house. We want you to live in house. We want you to eat meals at your house. We want you to show up at chapter. We want you to be at parties for part of it. We want you to um, we want you to be involved in your philanthropy and DM and all these things that Greek life is doing because that's how you have an impact on people is you have to be present with them. Have you had, ever had anybody in your life that impacted you that you never saw? That you were never with? No, you, you impact people that you're closest to. So that's why I love grief ministry because you guys are always together with people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that don't know Christ. And sometimes you're the only Jesus they'll ever see because they won't make it into this room. They won't make it to church with you. And you get to be incarnational and you get to be present with them. So that's one way you can humble yourself, because it is a lot easier to move out of house. It is a lot cheaper to eat your own meals at home. It is a lot easier to do your own thing on game day and not show up at the tent. There's a lot easier things than to be present in Greek life. Especially you guys that live in house, it's like, I know, the weekends are long. You don't go to bed until 3, 4, 5 in the morning, and then you're trying to get up and go to church, and you just want to knock on everybody's door and wake them up when you leave, right? I know, that's the way it feels. Like, they cut me up. I'm going to wake them up. Don't do that. That wouldn't be very humble. But here's a warning. Even though this is a value of being present, there's a warning. Some of you need to not be as present as you currently are because you're not ready yet for that environment. So this is a little disclaimer here. You've got to be really confident in your identity in Christ in order for you to be fully present in ministry and to be at all those things where all that other stuff happens that the enemy's trying to lure you into. So I want some of you tonight to hear, you shouldn't be at every party. You shouldn't be at every tailgate. You shouldn't be at everything that you guys are doing. You need to kind of step back. See, Jesus knew who he was. And ironically, the Bible says two different times at Jesus' baptism and then another time when he uh, did his trans figuration thing, he kind of got all bright and glowy and he showed himself who he really was. Two times the Bible says that God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son who I love, with him I am well pleased. So it even seems like at some point Jesus needed some confirmation. Probably not, maybe it was just for the people around, but we need that confirmation. We need to be so grounded in who we are in Christ that then we can be present in the incarnational ministry. So if you're not at that place yet, it is okay for you to back out of some of that stuff and maybe go to the party from 9 to 10, but don't stay past 11. Don't stay past 12. You know when it gets bad, get out before then, otherwise you're going down too. And we don't want you guys going down with the rest of them. Because I guarantee you, if they go out to midtown, guess what? They're coming back. You don't always have to go with them. They're going to come back. And the next day they'll be there too. And that's why Greek ministry is so great, because you see these people every single day whether you want to or not. So be incarnational. That's one way to be humble. And if you're ready within the, your identity in Christ, if you know who you are and you're not looking to be, uh, if you're not looking for the approval of others in your chapter, then you can be incarnational that way. Uh, the second thing that comes right out of the passage is be obedient. One way to humble yourself is to be obedient. Surrender yourself to the Lordship of Christ. He is the King and the Master. He's not just your friend and your Savior, although He is that. He is also the King and the Lord. And that implies something. That implies you bow your knee to the King. 
I know we don't have a king here in America, and so it's hard for us to, to envision that. But when you think about the Old Testament, if someone came into the presence of the king, they had the option to kill that person or to let them live. So there is this sense of awe and respect that the king has that sometimes we miss in our modern day Christianity where Jesus is our buddy and our friend and he's our savior. But we need to recapture this biblical idea that Jesus is the Lord and he deserves our obedience. In fact, Jesus said it like this, if you love me, you will obey me. And if you obey me, you will love me. It's kind of cyclical. When does it start? When does it end? When is it love and when is it obedience? Uh -huh, it's both. If you love me, you will obey me. And he deserves our obedience. So, be present, be incarnational, be obedient and surrender to Jesus. And this is the idea. When you're going after your own selfish desires, put Jesus on the throne. Ask him to control you, to empower you, to lead you, to guide you, to give you wisdom, to give you strength to get you out of that temptation, to whatever it is you need, He will do that. But, but bow your knee to Him. By grace, through faith, bow your knee. The last one is be sacrificial. Be a doulos servant and serve those in your chapter. I know the first thought you might be having is, you know what, the, the people in my chapter, they don't deserve to serve them. <laughs> Precisely. That's why you are to serve them. If Jesus had waited to come to earth for those who deserved him, he would have never come. So here's my challenge to you is serve that person in your chapter that least deserves it. Serve that girl, ladies, when she comes back from Midtown and she needs someone to hold her hair out. You know what I'm saying? Serve that person. Uh, there are a thousand different examples, and you guys are going to get a chance to talk about that in your discussion groups. But I want to encourage you to be sacrificial, to serve those in your chapter, because if you do, it will definitely go noticed. You will not be unnoticed serving people, doing the thing that nobody else wants to do. How about this? Guys, how about you drive the pledges somewhere? I see can't stop you from doing that, can't I? So like, how can we turn Greek life upside down to where we, the believers who are really following Christ, are the ones that are serving one another. So I want to give you guys a chance to talk about that in your groups and come up with some ideas. Uh, first, which circle best represents your life right now and why? That would be the first question. The second is, how could being humble, what could it look like in Greek life? And specifically, how can you humble yourself in your chapter? I'd love you guys to come up with at least one thing on number two and three in your groups, and then we can maybe share uh, together. So go ahead in your groups and try to answer those questions with each other.